So I'm Robert. Uh, I'm a steward at Flashbots. We're here talking about MEV and how they are. We have the scene panel of uh, Karthik, Mads, Ed, and Marcus here. So we will skip introductions and then we'll just get into it. So the contact side, I don't, I don't know that everyone knows what LVR is. And so can one of you give a, a few sentence summary of what LVR is and why we're we talking about it today? Yeah, I think how I view LVR is the cost of information. Like in 12 seconds, no block. I guess bringing it back to the end we all know, sandwiching, right? This is basically an uninformed user submitting an order, it has some naive slippage. And now there is a market that's created by ordering this with other transactions that touch the same state, giving the user worse execution and then blocking some of that from the user. Um, now, LVR is different. It's um, kind of the information that is in exogenous venues in 12 seconds. Um, that you reach the consensus of Ethereum 1. Um, I mean, you can send exchanges, price is Ethereum 10 is right? And because price on Ethereum only updates every 12 seconds, now if there's any volatility realized off chain, this is basically taking or, or auctioning off the um, opportunity to take liquidity from LPs at strictly better than what the true price is. And this causes LPs to lose a lot of money. Um, over $750 million in senior. So it's purely the effect of the system given that it's a lot of it. There's very specific points to um, extract value from the LPs, and they are bidding this value back to the closers. But I think that we all agree we can make more competitive options that we would have to be truly at this point. I can try to narrow it down, maybe some one sentence. Um, LDR is the loss that LP specifically make because they offer prices that are out of line with the current market prices. They're selling too cheap. So the blockchain has, has a 12 second heartbeat, at least on ETH L L L1, and constantly decentralized exchanges are competing, prices update, so the blockchain prices drift, right? And that's where LDR comes from. Mm -hmm. So, what do we do about this? What are, what, what, how do we mitigate that LDR on our investment? Hold an auction. Yes. Go again. Okay. We're gonna hold. We should hold an auction. We're holding one right now. We're collecting a lot of revenue and giving it to Coinbase and Lido. Yeah. 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 We should be basically giving it to the people who are in the call. If the price moves a hundred dollars and you sell Ethereum for a hundred dollars cheaper than it's actually worth, if you lost a hundred dollars. And the Coinbase validator who is validating the block for those 12 seconds makes $100 and makes sense. But it's, uh, it's all a function of like the last let's win now for this kind of block space being 12 seconds, right? If you're able to now build systems on top of ETHL1 that have the same kind of security guarantees of setting to an ETHL1 block, but now we give this last look to the end proposer maybe. Um, 0.5 seconds prior to the block being submitted, you know, very competitive options, get a lot of value back to LPs, um, and have a more sustainable system incentive wise while still being disinformed. Um, I think LVR is really only half of the problem. So, LVR, you describe it as LPs are not making enough money, maybe they're, you know, they're selling too cheap. But what about the opposite case where, you know, a self-sufficient MM doesn't have price information from auction, it is not able to compete with someone more informed that provides best prices. And so as a result, or the flow will be the MM. Um, kind of like the approach that we're taking is more like, you know, let's start by decoupling a um, source of capital from market making logic, right? So basically we, we build a framework where um, you know Passive LPs can delegate liquidity to more sophisticated entity. They can do certain actions off-chain and on-chain. There are certain prescribed bonds in the smart contract, a lot of checks. And that off-chain entity could be, you know, centralized market maker that might be very good, or a centralized market maker distributed across a full tunnel network, running the same strategy but still signing some forum just so it's not a centralized server. Or it could, you could plug into an auction to this system and it would still work in the same way. So I think all of those valid approaches, um, auctions, market makers, off-chain oracles, they all basically provide the same service to the AMM. They help in the AMM to not have a state price. So basically making the AMM quote dynamically 
Um, and these are different ways. And maybe there are more ways to achieve that, but the outcome is always the same, is that the AMM does simply not quote the same price. Do you think that traditional AMMs, like you swap V2, but V3? In the presence of LVR. Um, I think they, they might. We've seen V2 be quite resilient in some scenarios, even though V3 is just obviously better than the like. Um, so we might see V2 continue to stay around because it's easier for the people on the pumped up fund of Ethereum to. It depends how irrational a lot of these are in terms of like their MP now and what they could be getting. Um, and LPs have been known to be quite irrational given that B2 is so thin and very, very deep in liquidity. And so is B3, even though there's been countless research and, and um, attention brought to the fact that LPs are actually losing money. So, whether it will send the test of time is perhaps a question that is difficult to answer, but I think that we can definitely make um, basically like zero cost improvements on the system and make it a sustainable system incentive wise that would be far more um, practical for LPs to, to uh, provide on. Are, are LPs actually losing money or are we misunderstanding what's going on? Yeah, can we get into this? I, I just hate this. LPs are losing money. Oh, the LP healer. Or, you know, you, like this guy probably was a whale that came about, made like $100 billion in early crypto, and then stuck it on an AMM, and he's losing some money. Who cares? Like, what, what really happens is people stake on these AMMs. And they will do it up to the point where it's possible to do so. The reason we care about LBR is not going to be profitable at all. It's going to be zero profit in equilibrium. They're going to earn the risk free rate, risk adjusted to whatever risk they're taking. That's fine. That's good. That's how like efficient market hypothesis works. But what we really care about is what is the resulting spread. That is what the users care about. That's what the system cares about. At the end of the day, if there's a huge deadly loss because a bunch of money is being sucked out of the system for no reason then the spread is going to be wider, and that is not what we want. We want like, smaller spreads. There's smaller spreads in TradFi than there are on chain because of this problem. Yeah, I think the, um, the amount that we're making right now in the block space battle to proposers is just factored into how much LPs are charging, right? So 30 bits on like, um, Rappi, uh, Rappi, or yeah, ETH Rappi, and then like 30 bits as well, so most likely people for around 40 ETH USDC. And if we minimize the tailwind loss, now it's going to feasibly go to five bits, so everyone's happy. I mean, we can probably go below the risk free rate even. Like, I'm, I would challenge even that we need the risk free rate. If you offer something else to the LPs, like they're actually buying a portfolio that they want, and they are fully fine with exactly that exposure, then they have, then they would be fine with zero, with, with the zero. Like, the portfolio option that they're buying is. The value that they're getting. I think this narrative has been around for a while as like a code for the fact that they <laughs> don't work. And it's not convincing to me because if you want the portfolio right now, it's actually cheaper to buy it on like Binance and just balance it yourself because Binance has one bit of rebalancing fee and you're eating like 30 bit of rebalancing fee even on the like P3 pool. You're the RD who's right on the like the LDR is like. Sure, sure, but retail wouldn't physically be able to have the infrastructure to constantly balance and buy that. So even at a bit, right? This is like we have the tenure. Do you all think that this is the problem to solve in order to make crypto competitive with TradFi pricing? Yes. <laughs> Slam it <dunk>. up. <laughs> Your mic isn't working, by the way. Oh, it isn't? Okay, I'll talk louder. Um, um, okay, maybe, maybe a, another question. So one really common, or a common um, way of addressing this is an app-specific sequencing model, where you have an AMM, it has its own sort of ordering rules, and you kind of the rest of the block to the order. supporter. Um, I think this is what you all are pursuing at, at Toronto, at least. Uh, uh, but in turn, if you have your own app-specific sequencing, you lose composability. 
Uh, and is this sort of a, a fundamental trade-off? Are there things that we can do about it? Is this what we need? Is like every different AMM has a sequencing role? Yeah, I think the market forces will definitely move to this kind of um, non-composable application state law framework, right? Because if you think about what composability allows for from an application perspective, it's either I'm a DEX and I'm composable with other DEXs, and at the end of the block there is a, a mispricing, and now my liquidity is getting all up against their liquidity, right? Um, and it's strictly going to be worse off to allow for composability than to maintain control of the state and for whatever logic you want to make sure that you're holding a fair option inside the application. Um, and then having this kind of asynchronous composability. So the routing problem comes harder, right? Previously, I could um, atomically route between, in order, um, between oh, yeah. different DEXs. Now, given that some DEXs are like, kind of controlled around the state, um, I instead have a scatter problem to solve, where there's some um, Oracle signal, maybe a sign process or change price, and I know that this non composable AMM is going to execute within some bound of this sign process change price. And if I think that I can source a liquidity from this AMM better than what the other AMMs are offering, then I will take all the other legs of the um, route through the other AMMs, and I will basically take on the inventory risk for the AMM that I think I can source better liquidity from, which is in the non composable form. And this is a scatter problem. It's a problem that market makers and traditional finance are very good at it, so making profit and expectations. And I think that this is what we'll see the solver market compared to. So taking inventory strategically, not doing anything um, that's deterministically composable, but still very solvable and very um, democratic. Um, we take a bit of a different approach in that you can think about our approach as a soft one, where if an AMM hasn't been updated in a while, where an update could come from an off-chain batch auction or some sort of price update from a market maker, the AMM will have a pretty large spread, but still, it is permissionless and composable by default. But if you manage to land these spots very frequently on top of every block, you still get benefits of like filling some, some leg of the trade to resolve it directly, whilst updating the AMM and lowering the spread if there's not a lot of latency. Since you was that I'll pay for my chain. Is this working? No. Okay, there's like potentially an on chain liquidity duel that happens that we don't discuss enough, but like the retail users don't just exist. They're not like totally stupid. They use routers, they want a good price, and if you cannot give it to them, then they will go elsewhere. And then it will be even worse for the LPs and the spreads will get even wider, and the users will go away even more. And so we need to be like very careful not to uh, rely. I think what happened is there was basically a bunch of shitcoin subsidies happening, all getting pumped into subsidizing and putting in these pools. It's going away, and then you see things on Twitter like, oh, it's hard to get good execution on chain these days because like the, the liquidity is drying up. Well, yeah, the liquidity is drying up because uh, there's no more shitcoin subsidies going on. So uh, if we don't figure out how to plug the hole that was being filled by hundreds of millions of dollars a year of shit from subsidies, then all of the trading is going to go off chain. What's the role of a block builder in all of this? Well, I think right now the market for block building is very integrated. You have the market makers who are the main block builders because it's very profitable to be able to compete at these uh, sophisticated arbitrage opportunities, sex sectors, and so um, and also be able to, in some sense, price that competition. Right? If I'm building the entire block, and now let's say there's one searcher who is beating me consistently at just arbitrating the EPOCC pair on a central exchange. Um, I feasibly, through building the entire block and arbitrating perhaps the top 80 tokens on central exchanges, can now just say I'm going to censor him to oblivion until he stops arbitrating his pair, and then I can go back to arbitrating it and making new money. Um, and given that dynamic, this is very centralizing, obviously, not competitive, or as competitive as it can be. Um, in the framework where apps take control of their state, now the block building job is very easy, right? You essentially have like, applications with modules, they are not touching the Brooklyn state, so the block builder would just have to do a check that, okay, this is um, um, actually good to go, that none of the um, users of the application specific modules in the block are trying to toss everyone by sending transactions like nonce or by wiping out their funds and bidding off to 
um, getting put in the transaction prior to the application just picked on the app. But in this case, now you can easily see that anyone on like a consumer hardware device could build blocks if all applications move to um, this uh, state block framework. Yeah, I think there, there's probably like two quite opposing options for block builders. One is that they become, uh, that it becomes very simple, um, that there isn't much contentious state to, to sequence anymore, um, and that there is not much um, MEV to be captured, therefore not that much value in private order flow, and then block building becomes simple. Or that you actually, because the block builder has the last look, use the block builder to be the auctioneer. And the block builder becomes a crucial part of the auction and giving back um, the MEV to the user. If the transaction um, exposes this optionality, then um, the block builder could become the option. Yeah, I, I don't have a strict preference, but these are like two quite strictly different um, features you can see from block builders. Uh, I have a strict preference for not making the block builders the auctioneer for LBR because we you know that in other scenarios where we need them the auctioneer, they have not exactly done what they said they were going to do. Uh, you know this set of all. Is there something specific you want to talk about? <laughs> I'm just saying, I mean, it's, it's like when you sell them, hey, run this auction, you're, you can't tell us exactly what's going on because that's all of your alpha, but you know, trust, we'll, we'll trust you with that money until the proceeds, and then they don't necessarily do it, and you, you catch them, and you say, don't do that, but they're 30% of the blocks, you can't really get them out for good, right? Approximately how it works, yeah. I feel like there's a there's a general set of rules, particularly around order flow, that block builders do generally and directionally try to follow. Um, but there's all sorts of weird edge cases, and it's not always clear you know, how to, to live up to the particular rules. Um, we had a, a case the other, the other day where we sent a block really early on um, that was supposed to give the user a refund. And uh, we built that block really early in a way that didn't give the user all that much refund. And then really late in the block, the big refund came in. Um, and we didn't get a cancellation to a relay in time, just because of timing. And people got upset at us. But it's, it's like we're trying to follow the rules. It's just like the timing of the system doesn't work in a way in which we can to use a refund. Anyway, that's to say that I feel like directionally, people are trying to. But there are cracks all over the system. No, but this is like exactly the, the type of stuff that makes it hard to police because obviously you think that your flashbots is a good actor, but the fact that these kind of things can happen to somebody who's a gray actor means that the gray actor can say, oops, I messed up, you know, I forgot to cancel it, and I got to do thing up because of it. And uh, you know, what do we do in that scenario? Because um, they could just as easily have done it on for a second. I agree with that. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, what happens to the building and searching market if LDR doesn't exist anymore? Does it just resolve down into those two, uh, two, two different paradigms that Marcus is laying out? Or is there something else that goes on in the market? Well, uh, I mean, it's a lot smaller, which is kind of what we'd like to see, I guess. I don't think we necessarily need a huge apparatus of people like uh, sucking yeah. 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 in the opportunity. Yeah. Right now, the design is such that, like, it would be even worse if it wasn't a blood sucking apparatus. So you have to have it, but I would like to see an Ethereum that is less extractive overall. And if we, if we got rid of LDR, it's a huge chunk of the overall that would be that would just be going down. And when that happens, there's you know, less reason to invest capital and invest, you know, get like little like Putnam finalists like thinking about this stuff all day and rather than you know, thinking about how to go to Mars or whatever. So um, I think it's really our job as application developers to make their lives so easy that they either become solvers or they just include transactions for the without much work at all. Yeah, the super market will still be there, still competing on the same opportunity, just redirecting it to the right party and also making it more decentralized and, and permissionless to actually join this competition. Hopefully that will result in um, you know, tighter spreads for the end user, also for the providers and just overall just like more permission as a single decentralized um, swap person. I appreciate that. Yeah, nice show. Um, the uh, uh, question that I had, and I'll kick it over to the audience for five or ten minutes for questions. 
Um, if you can get that on the credit. The question that I had is, can you really avoid the block builder being the auctioneer to these LVR auctions in the long term anyway? Um, because uh, isn't the block builder going to be able to seal the auction at the very last moment anyway? And that always gives them an, an edge. Um, so there's a big incentive for the LNG the same party. Well, you can like gate the access to the underlying pool by arbitrary logic, right? And you can see a system where there's a centralized sequencer that's doing this and the process can be fair and not censoring. You can also see a system where you have an ABS with a bunch of restake nodes and the access to the pool is gated by two thirds of the restake node signing off that this is the one node that is touching that state. Um, and in both these systems, there is no last list that can be disrupted because it's gated by like, deterministic criteria that the user opts into and they believe it is fair and going to give them the best execution to work. Or at least give their order and fill it in the um, most performing kind of option. I think this is right. You can make it so that the pool doesn't work if the block owner doesn't cooperate. That doesn't necessarily mean that they get zero rent, though, because they can also just say, well, you're not giving me any rent, so you don't get to be in my block anyway. Um, so I think they still get some rent in this scenario. There is a way, but it requires changing Ethereum itself, that lets us hold these auctions and give the revenue to the right person. It's called multiple concurrent proposers. I've been like yapping about it for a long time. But the way it works is the reason it's hard to hold these auctions and give the revenue to the right person is there's only one person who has the power to include transactions. And so they can basically choose one of the bits to include, and that thing might be the person who bribed them the most. And so they effectively have to review auction, as you were saying, Robert. Um, and the way we get around that is we break up the monopoly. Uh, and the way you break up the monopoly is by adding more competition. Yeah, just for like, the, the multi proposer design, there's purely for the censorship resistance to at the end, but like the applications will have their own logic to kind of internalize it. Right. And then just make it so that this absolutely formula can't be censored by the last step that the proposal is. That's just pure logic. Yeah, I think it would be good because people like Project would not have to be spending so much time figuring out how to run the auction, and, and Ethereum would take care of that, and you guys would be figuring out. Uh, all of the specifics of how to do it in a way that makes it best for users. And uh, instead, you guys are spending you know, hours and hours on blackboards like proving that your auction system works. And I would just rather we take care of that. Everybody wants this who's building a D app, basically, whether they know it or not. Everybody wants this. So, why have every team like go cook it up themselves and make some different solution after their own? It's just let the theory do it. That's what it's for, right? Um, I feel like our role has to evolve here because usually as an app developer it's just you write a spec, you write a smart contract, audit them and launch them. But I feel like you need to do like an extra step which is you need to think carefully about what is the required ordering of sequencing for my app to work in the best interest of the you, of all the users. The block builder is not using device to do that for you, at least not today. So uh, thinking about a trade-off so like doing this through some lock state or like off-chain validator network is one way to do it. But there might be others to explore as well. As for censorship, I don't have a good answer, but I hope that that was the answer. something. Any questions from the audience? I just have one about app specific sequencing is like the way that things are headed in here. Yeah, how are you? I mean, it's maybe related to what we just heard, but yeah, how are you thinking about the censorship resistance and how it changes if the apps themselves are the ones dealing with this? Then you have like a new censorship model or censorship vector. Yeah, I think like the good thing about absolute sequencing um, is that you can just think of it as like a state lock on the application, and now you know it doesn't touch any conflicting state or um, a contentious state. Um, now all you need is an inclusion group bump, right? You don't need like an execution group bump. I think that's way too hard um, to actually build it out. But if we have a system where there's like a competitive inclusion pre for market, and then this can be done in any proposer in the 32 salt bucket. Um, and then any of the next proposers can just include this one for settlement on the other one if they want. Um, this is not too much tech debt um, and also very useful for apps that, that um, control their own state. Other CR designs would be multi proposer or um, inclusionless, which both are feasible but also require like hard work to do. Inclusionless is not helpful for this. Just that bad. Because it's too delayed, it doesn't let you get your transaction in time to be fast enough to contribute to the auction, basically. 
Uh, at least for the current design. Maybe you can make a better design, and that would basically just be multiple composers. But the current designs are too late. They're one block too late to do anything. Um, can I ask a question, Frederick? Um, what will happen if you guys launch, you guys get a bunch of traction with your own like version, and then I wrangle the troops in like three years or two years at the most optimistic. We ship multi proposer to the protocol. Mine is like, mine is, you're, you're like a poison. Max is being <laughs> um, So what will happen? We, we finally do it. Is it going to be too late? Are you going to be in a monopoly position and not give the like give it back? Well, I'd say we're pretty aligned actors in this space, so it would be up to um, I guess the end execution quality of the user, right? Like if it's already working. We can prove that it's good execution quality, our nodes are doing the job they're supposed to, and this is strictly optionality that the user's opting into, right? So if it's working and they're opting into it, then I don't think there's a reason to make them opt out of it. That being said, um, I do agree with you that controlling app state is a monopolizing force, um, but I think that this is potentially um, a good thing because then you can just have the maximal choice on behalf of the user of the specific trust assumptions that they want to opt into, and then they'll move liquidity to where they think is right, where they think they're getting fair prices, and then the best market at the end of the day. That combines both decentralization and also less than true Ethereum decentralization, but um, that lack of, or that additional security assumption is resulting in better price for the user. Um, that market is right. Everybody is aligned until like you're making $100,000 a day for two years, and then Metallic knocks on the door and asks for it back, right? Then we'll see how it we are. <laughs> but then you can spin up another Angstrom like DAX in the multi proposer sense. And if the users who are providing liquidity or the swappers who are swapping on the platform want to opt into that and be even more aligned, um, all power to them, right? Market forces. Yeah, but like you guys are going to give some rent to the users are building on top of Uniswap. Why are we here? Right? Like, because Uniswap built a product and now they're able to, you know. Get, get some money to the next wave. There's no uh, future with you as well. <laughs> <laughs> it's a skill issue. It's a skill issue. <laughs> okay, another question. Uh, I, have, I have a question. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you had the incentive that the people are losing money because they're all big whales, and uh, it's not really that important, but like, Realistically, if the best case strategy is just zero, right? You lose money by default. How do you attack the What's the only big well? The only one for well, like using bad on a strategy will lose money for sure, and maybe you will just not lose money for your attack details to do and it's just chicken and egg, right? But you can only lose money if you have so much. No, I mean, the, there's like some pot of money from retail who's willing to eat the spread to trade back and forth, right? <laughs> And uh, basically, you can buy a piece of that money by depositing it into the pool. When you do that, you also buy a piece of the negative side of the LDR. And so if there's a small number of LPs and a large number of traders, then the, the small number of LPs will get a lot of revenue from the voice traders. And if there's a large number of LPs and a large number of traders, then each LP will only get a little sliver of that big pot of money from the large number of voice traders, right? And so I think what I'm saying is just let it be efficient market, let them make what they can make elsewhere because that's like what it should be in the efficient market. We shouldn't care too much, you know, whether they're making money or not. Nobody should be making money in equilibrium. Uh, everybody should be making the same amount of money everywhere. One more question. Uh, yeah, I mean, this this whole uh, LBR is being focused with LP losing money. It's a to me that we work on a very small shape, and there's some fairly kind of fundamental changes being proposed to kind of solve that issue. Uh, I'm wondering if um, you think that there's potentially something that's being missed here. Like, is, is trading volume and the income uh, really uh, a substitute? Is the exposure of the underlying capital inside the LP pool being badly managed? And is that like a big part of the loss? So where are these individuals? If you're holding 50% of the asset that is decreasing in value, um, are these ever going to make up for that? 
Yeah, this is more different. So this is like um, um, a very studied problem in traditional finance, and presumably the LPs would factor whatever market risk they think that they're taking in into this percentage of retail trades going through the pool versus import trades, right? So they would demand higher fees for this, and that's a question for them to ask: is is this is the fee revenue going to be worth me taking market risk for holding a shit point? Um, that being said. LBR is more of the issue of debt away loss, right? Where this is leaking to the proposer because information is accruing on external venues. Um, and instead, we can redirect this and charge lower swap fees to the end of the That's it. Thank you so much for listening.